This is Neptune. The next stop is Pluto. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. One day, with top-notch future technologies, one stop from Neptune to Pluto won't seem much further than Times Square from Bryant Park today. There are huge ice mountains on Pluto, valleys that go further than your eyes can see, 160-mile large craters, almost as big as the largest one on Earth, and no life. The reasons are obvious. The long distance between Pluto and the Sun guarantees freezing temperatures on that dwarf planet. It also ensures a trip of a few billion miles. Plus, it's smaller than the Moon, so it would get crowded very soon if people started dwelling there. Still, there's one reason which makes life there not that far-fetched. The Sun has a lifespan and cycles within it. Our solar system used to be nothing but a cloud of gas and dust. As a result of a gravitational collapse at the center of this cloud, the gas and dust started gathering in specific, denser places. These pulled more and more matter as time went on, and something called conservation momentum made the mass start rotating and heating up because of immense pressure. Later, there appeared a disk similar to what Saturn has, but it was made of entirely different substances. And right in the center, there was the ball that eventually became the Sun. A protostar is a young star that's still gathering its mass, and that's exactly what the Sun was before the temperatures and pressures inside of it lighted up its core. Millions of years later, it became the Sun we see every day. But it won't stay this way forever. It will heat up even more and eventually get bigger and denser, turning into a red giant. It may one day get big enough to swallow up Venus and Mercury. Chances are, it might swallow even planet Earth. Even if it doesn't devour our planet, the Sun might get close enough to touch us. Well, if this happened, life on Earth wouldn't be possible. But then, in just a few minutes, the Sun loses about 40% of its mass and shrinks about 10 times what it used to be. It's not as bright, and indeed, not as hot as it used to be. By this moment, Earth will have already been deserted. People might want to start traveling around space, or settle down on another planet where life is sustainable, like the exoplanet Kepler-62f, which, by the way, is even bigger than Earth. While all of this was happening, Pluto was changing. Before, every resource was frozen inside of the dwarf planet. Water, gases like methane, carbon monoxide, you name it. But as the Sun was reaching its peak luminosity, Pluto was slowly warming up and losing a lot of what it had to the vastness of space. At the same time, an atmosphere formed up. If the atmosphere gets thick enough, it would create favorable life conditions. Then, instead of spaceships, a tiny percentage of us would be able to set up colonies on the dwarf planet. The temperature is comfortable there, almost t-shirt weather. It even resembles Earth a tiny bit. Canyons filled with water, beautiful endless fields with trees, and lots of space to run around, and mineral water pockets on the ground, good enough to drink. Pluto's rotations are different than Earth's. An Earth day is 24 hours, and sometimes it still feels like it never ends. But on Pluto, a whole rotation around the Sun takes 153 hours, because it's pretty far away from the Sun. After several hours without sleep, we get tired and our eyes get red. It means we'd have to take several naps throughout the day on Pluto. A year on Pluto equals 248 Earth years. Unless we come up with some sort of technology to get us to live that long, our entire lifespan would be less than half a year on the dwarf planet. So, houses on Pluto might need to be equipped with cryo chambers. Whenever you feel like dreaming for a long time, you jump in it and wake up 50 Pluto days later. On the dwarf planet, there are also seas and beaches. So it's just like a tiny Earth, far away from the actual Earth. The food on Pluto could be tastier, we might find a way to make the ingredients more savory and even try to grow them faster during the trip. You plant a carrot, and two days later, it's ready to be in your salad. There could also be new ingredients for our salads on Pluto. Maybe two meter tall mushrooms we've never seen before. The animals we would take with us on the trip would get released into their new home forever. And with time, they would evolve and adapt to their new environments. The law of the jungle could change a bit too. Lions might not be kings anymore. Deer are. Their antlers are twice the size of what they used to be. But to be fair, so are the deer. Most of the animals that were already here used to live underwater. But with time, 
the amphibians started shifting to the surface, just like Earth at the beginning of life. Pluto could only be a temporary home, though. Once the sun has finally reached its final phase, Pluto would get frozen and lifeless again. People instead would need to try to find a planet that stays in the Goldilocks zone of another galaxy. The Goldilocks zone is the exact proper distance from the star like the sun, where the temperature is perfect for the water to stay liquid. It's the rule scientists search for when looking for other planets that can sustain life. We can try setting new colonies on one such planet, or even try to set up our own artificial home. Not exactly a planet or a spaceship, but a combination of both. Something huge built right in space. Say, a wheel with gravity everywhere we go, so we don't fall off. It would float in space toward the new exoplanet, capable of fitting entire states in. This whole trip might happen just because the sun first grew too much, and then, having reached the culmination of its life cycle, it would finally become a white dwarf. It's gonna be a pretty long journey, and entire generations will be born here. You'll have a choice, sleep your way through the journey until humans finally reach their new exoplanet, or enjoy the trip in this fantastic spaceship. There's all you need on board, malls bigger than those on Earth, large futuristic cities, even places to farm, fields with rich soil made artificially, and finally, after a long journey, the exoplanet. It's even somewhat better than Earth. The planet is giant and has more continents. The continent's center isn't as far from oceans, which means there aren't as many desert areas. Though the sun of this planet is an orange dwarf, it's not as hot as our yellow dwarf sun today. It's a bit smaller, but here's the kick. Orange dwarfs live somewhat longer. They remain stable for between 15 billion and 45 billion years. Despite that, this new planet is full of rainforests because the planet itself is warmer. It means more biodiversity and creatures we've never seen before. But even if nothing out there is suitable, we could try and terraform this planet instead. If we take Mars as an example, we could create a greenhouse effect by smashing ice-rich comets and releasing ammonia in them, making the planet warmer. We could also start planting trees. We'd probably need some Earth soil to do that, or we'd have to modify Mars's soil to be similar to ours. Sooner rather than later, the atmosphere would be close to the one we have on Earth. We'd be able to breathe, too, because of the trees. Then, we can melt Mars's polar ice caps and, voila, water. The problem is the solar winds and sun explosions that might strip it of an atmosphere just as quickly as we can create one, if not faster. It has no magnetosphere either, which means it can't protect us from radiation. So long-term Mars wouldn't be a good choice. Maybe out there in the vastness that is space, there is a perfect planet waiting for us. Frozen plains, mountains with white peaks glistening in the distant sun, and rustic red snow. Hmm? Welcome to Pluto, where nothing makes sense anymore. Looking at it from a distance, the ice ball planet is mostly predictably winter shades of white and light blue. Once you land on the surface, you'll notice familiar blue skies as well. But see that whale-shaped red stain running along the equator? Right there, to the left of the white heart-shaped region, thar she blows! This spot is bigger than Alaska, and it's a mystery to scientists. That's not red clay soil or anything you'll see on Earth. That's Pluto's version of ice. Scientists believe it's red because the atmosphere drops this strange suit-like chemical called tholin on the surface. It's the same stuff that explains the red cap on Pluto's moon Charon. Now, let's zoom in closer on the whale. Oh look, we have a mountain range. Yes, Pluto's red ice is like rock, hard enough to form entire mountains. Those white peaks standing out against the dark red aren't snowy caps like we have on Earth. That's frozen methane. For such a small planet, Pluto's mountains are epic, bigger than Everest and made entirely of ice. Such a bizarre landscape can't be found anywhere else in our solar system. Yeah, Pluto's a pretty harsh cold place. Temperatures there can dip to minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. The coldest ever recorded on Earth was in Antarctica, a measly minus 135. Now let's head back to the heart of Pluto. That's actually a vast plain covered in nitrogen ice. Scientists discover that Pluto's heart makes the winds on the planet blow. Craters are also big, and some of them show signs of filling and erosion. That's something that happens right here on Earth. When land is worn away and shaped by natural forces like wind, water, and ice, that's erosion. 
So what makes all this so special on Pluto? It could be evidence of tectonic plate activity. You know, big plates of land surfing on liquid rock, forming mountain chains, breaking continents apart, putting them back together? That's something scientists so far have only ever seen on Earth, not on any other planet in the solar system. Now, looks like Pluto could be more like our own planet. That, and there's water on Pluto. One third of its surface, in fact. But of course, it's not like Earth water. It's more like a rocky slushy. Yum. Still, no signs of life out there. At least, not for now. It's taken a long time to get the little information we know about Pluto. It was first discovered almost 100 years ago and deemed the ninth planet from the Sun. Until 2006, when its official planet membership card was revoked. Poor Pluto. It was dubbed the biggest dwarf planet in the Kuiper Belt, a region outside our solar system full of other dwarf planets and icy bodies circling the Sun. A few months before that, they launched the New Horizons mission. It was the first space probe researchers sent to Pluto in 2006. Zipping at over 35,000 miles per hour, that's 45 times the speed of sound, it still took the probe almost a decade to reach its destination. That's how far away the tiny planet is. In fact, Pluto is nearly 40 times the distance from Earth to the Sun. If you were there looking up at the sky, you'd see the Sun as a tiny dot like any other star in the sky. Once New Horizons finally reached Pluto in 2015, it got close enough to get some incredible pictures of the surface. It also collected important data and observations, like those strange red spots and that heart-shaped region. But Pluto gets even stranger, especially its orbit. Most other planets go around the Sun in almost perfect circles with the Sun close to the center. The Sun is nowhere near the center of Pluto's orbit, and the orbit is so stretched out that Pluto sometimes crosses into Neptune's path and gets closer to the Sun than the blue gas giant. So, the unusual effect of this strange orbit? Pluto sometimes has an atmosphere, and sometimes not. When it's closer to the Sun, a thin atmosphere of nitrogen forms. But once the planet starts moving further away from our Sun, the atmosphere freezes and falls to the surface in an ice storm of epic proportions. Pluto is probably a lot smaller than you imagine. If you put it on a map of the Earth, it would only span about halfway across the US. Yet this little planet has five moons spinning around it. And life on Pluto would be one endless year for us humans. Imagine, no birthdays your whole life. Since it was discovered in 1930, we still haven't seen it complete a full circle around the Sun. One year on Pluto is 248 Earth years. And we'll finally see that happen on March 23rd, 2178. Mark your calendar. Since Pluto got kicked out of the official planet club, Neptune became the last one in line. It's actually a big ball of ice and gas. So, like with the other gas giants, if you try to land on this planet, you just keep going deeper and deeper into seemingly endless clouds and atmosphere. Funny thing about the blue planet, it might not have a rocky surface like you and I are used to, but its surface-level gravity is about the same as Earth's. Same can't be said for any other planet in the solar system. As we make our way closer to the Sun, we pass the next gas giant, Uranus that non-conformist planet that goes around the Sun basically rolling on its side. One full orbit is 84 Earth years, so you might be lucky enough to celebrate your first birthday in your whole life there. Only one party, so you better make it count. And now we approach the jewel of the solar system, Saturn. The second biggest planet after Jupiter and another gas giant where you'd sink in an endless atmosphere if you tried to land a spaceship there. Saturn is the least dense planet of them all. Meaning, if you put it in a giant glass of water, it'd float. Those famous rings are made up of dust, ice, and rock. Some as tiny as a grain of sand, others bigger than houses. But get this, Saturn's rings are raining down on the planet, enough to fill an Olympic-sized pool in a half an hour. At that rate, the famous blue ring system will disappear completely in 300 million years. By the way, Neptune, Uranus, and Jupiter also have rings. They're just not as visible and bright as Saturn's. Imagine combining all the planets into one. Now make it two times bigger. Eh, still not as large as Jupiter. Scientists called it a failed star, since it's mostly made of helium and hydrogen, just like our Sun. But jumbo-sized Jupiter still isn't massive enough to kickstart the chemical processes that could turn it into a star. It's the fastest spinning planet, so it takes only 10 hours to complete a full rotation on its axis. 
Imagine trying to squeeze sleep, work, friends, hobbies, movies, shopping, your whole routine in less than half an Earth day. Magnificent tall mountains, the highest in the entire solar system. The most epic dust storms ever. Deep valleys, craters. I'm talking Mars, our potential home in the future. If you love sunsets, you'd definitely enjoy Martian ones. They're incredibly blue, while the sky throughout the day is pinkish red. Even though Mars is our closest neighbor, from the surface, the Sun would look half the size it does from Earth. So, not as close as it seems. Oh, and if you always dreamed of becoming a basketball player, Mars is your place. The red planet's gravity is only 37% of Earth's, so you jump three times higher there. Venus is a planet of extremes. The hottest surface, the most volcanoes, the brightest planet, and the closest one to Earth. It's also the slowest spinning and barely rotates, making a day on Venus last 243 Earth days. You could literally walk faster before the planet makes a complete turn. Venus also rotates in the opposite direction that Earth does, so sunrises are in the west and the sun sets in the east. Mercury. It doesn't have any moons or rings, and we're talking about the smallest planet in the whole solar system. A year lasts only 88 days, so if you live there, you'd have a lot of birthdays. Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, but it's actually not the hottest. That prize goes to Venus. Temperatures on Mercury don't get as high as on Venus because it doesn't have an atmosphere to trap heat from the Sun. What Mercury does have is wrinkles. Its iron core cooled and shrank, causing the surface to contract too and leaving all those wrinkles. That, or because it's so close to the Sun with no SPF. <laughs> Maybe. As you know, all the planets in our solar system orbit the Sun and bring a sense of order to the place. But guess what? There are two planets that could collide with each other and cause a cosmic catastrophe. Here's Neptune, the most far away planet in our solar system. It's 17 times heavier and 4 times bigger than the Earth. It's 30 astronomical units from the Sun. 1 AU is the distance between the Sun and the Earth, so it's 30 times farther away from our star than we are. And Neptune makes a complete circle around the Sun in 164 years in an almost perfectly round orbit. Neptune is cold, calm, and stable. But there's one planet that can ruin this balance, Pluto. It's a dwarf planet covered in rocks and ice. It's six times lighter and three times smaller than the Moon. We're interested in its orbit. If you look at a map of the solar system from above, you can see that it's not round but elliptical, so it's a slightly flattened circle. At its furthest point, Pluto is 49 Earth-Sun distances away from the Sun. When it moves, it comes closer to the star. At its closest point, Pluto is about 29.5 AU from the Sun. That's closer than Neptune. So, hypothetically, they could collide. Let's look at this collision from the front row. A little closer, please. Good. Neptune and Pluto are slowly approaching each other. They are both very cold worlds, but they begin to interact with each other gravitationally. Just like two magnets, it warms them up from the inside. Neptune is a gas giant. There's no solid surface there. So there's not much change in it yet. But Pluto has a rocky surface. Because of Neptune's gravitational influence, it's starting to crack. Pluto experiences continuous earthquakes. This causes it to heat up even more. When Pluto almost touches the gas giant, it begins to crumble from the inside out. Plus, Neptune has a very dense atmosphere. So the dwarf planet begins to ignite from friction with the gases in the upper atmosphere. Pluto is now very hot on one side and very cold on the other. This causes severe deformation, and it begins to crumble. Half of the dwarf planet's fragments remain in Neptune's orbit. They will collide with each other until they turn into dust and become new rings of the big planet. Other fragments will burn up in Neptune's atmosphere. And the biggest rocks that remain of Pluto will fall through Neptune until they're completely burned into dust. Neptune literally ate Pluto and continued its orbit without any change. All because the gas giant is 20 times larger and much heavier than the dwarf planet. So this collision would do no harm to Pluto. But it couldn't have happened in the first place, because their orbits don't actually cross. Let's look at the map of the solar system again. Not from above, but from the side. All nine planets here are on a horizontal line from the Sun. The distance between them is great, and their orbits don't cross. Here's Pluto's orbit. 
you can see that it's tilted relative to the horizontal line of all the other planets. It starts at the top, then dives under the orbits of the planets and comes back. So Pluto can never collide with Neptune. Still, planetary collisions have occurred in our solar system before. And thanks to these collisions, life appeared on Earth. Let's go back in time to almost 4.5 billion years ago. This ball of hot lava is Earth. It just formed from a cloud of dust and began to cool. But then, a wandering planet the size of Mars appeared on the horizon. It's called Theia. It was inevitably approaching our planet. The collision with Theia happened at a perfect angle. If Theia had hit us head-on, both planets would have been smashed to pieces. But it hit us almost at a tangent. Theia knocked some of the matter out of the young Earth and crumbled into rubble itself. It could no longer continue its journey because the Earth caught it in a gravitational trap. A large fragment of this planet remained in our orbit. Smaller fragments crashed into each other, falling to Earth or joining the remains of Theia. The dust settled, and we can see the familiar picture – the Earth and the Moon. This is the main theory of how it came to be next to us. Scientists say that it was this collision that caused life to appear on Earth. Theia brought a lot of ice on it, which turned into water on our planet. The new moon stabilized Earth's rotation, and conditions on the planet became perfect for the emergence of life. Another collision could create a blast wave that would spread out thousands of light years. Stellar collision. This usually occurs in binary systems, with a white dwarf and a regular star like our Sun. A white dwarf is the remains of a star that has gone out. As the stars get together, they start to move around each other in a spiral-like dance. The white dwarf pulls down the upper layers of the larger star. This hot plasma and stardust form a luminous disk. The two stars get closer and closer. When they finally merge, this causes a chain reaction in the core of the hot star. The mass of matter presses on the star's core too hard. This causes the innards of the combined star to heat up even more, and it expands, creating a supernova. This is one of the brightest events in the universe. The light from the explosion can be seen hundreds of light years away. Another spectacular view is the collision of a star with a black hole. Black holes are the heaviest objects in the universe, and their gravity is incredibly strong. So when a star and a black hole get close, the black hole starts eating the lighter matter of the star. The hot plasma, like spaghetti, heads toward the heart of the black nothingness. For an observer, this plasma seems to settle on the very edge of the black hole. It's called the event horizon. The thing is that time is much slower near such a heavy object. So we think the matter stays on the event horizon. But in fact, it's long gone into the heart of the black hole. As they get even closer, the black hole starts to literally tear the star apart and swallows it whole. At this point, the black hole spits out about half of the star's mass in the form of a beam of energy right out of its black heart. The other half of the star's mass becomes the black beast's food. We know of many black holes in our universe. The heaviest of them usually lies in the centers of galaxies. They can be millions of times heavier than the sun. But what would happen if two black holes collided with each other? Our scientists had the opportunity to observe such an event. Two black holes weighing 66 and 85 solar masses gradually approached each other. They danced together, bending the light passing by them. But then they merged into one enormous black hole, weighing 142 solar masses. That same second, the new black hole released gravitational waves into space with an energy of 9 solar masses. Scientists were able to catch these waves and observe the merging of the two black holes from the front seat. But this event actually happened about 17 billion years ago. We're only now seeing it because the particles of light and gravitational waves took so long to travel the distance of 17 billion light years to Earth. Now consider a galactic scale collision. Literally, it's a collision of the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy. This event will happen in 4.5 billion years, so stay tuned. The Milky Way has almost 100 billion stars. Andromeda has about 1 trillion. As the galaxies approach one another, they'll make several circles around each other. At that time, some stars may be ejected from the galaxies like from a slingshot. Then Milky Way and Andromeda will begin to merge. 
One scenario here is that our solar system will collide with another star system from Andromeda. In this case, there could be a stellar collision and a supernova afterwards. Our world would be destroyed. Another option is that the Sun would be ejected into dark space. In this case, we may not even notice the difference. All we'll see on Earth is a gradually disappearing starry sky, as our solar system will travel through dark space away from the home galaxy. But the most likely scenario is when the galaxies merge, it'll be completely painless for us. In fact, the space is very wide, and there's room for all the stars from both galaxies. The only difference is that we'll see a lot of new stars in the night sky, along with flying saucers from Andromeda. Nah, not really. But it's not the collision of galaxies that we should be worried about. It's our Sun. In 4.5 billion years, it'll become a red giant. It'll expand, swallowing up the nearest planets. Earth will probably be the first planet near the Sun. It'll be so hot that all life will simply disappear. And no one will be able to watch the galactic collision.